from that point of view of Zoom. So we would love this to be as sort of conversational as possible. So if you have a question at any time, uh, please feel free to either just take yourself off mute and ask a question. Otherwise, there is a little reactions icon down the bottom where you can pop your hand up. Um, and there's also a chat function as well. So if you have any questions and don't want to speak, you're more than welcome to, to type into the chat box. But yes, feel free to interrupt us at any time um, and we'll kick off. So I'll hand over to you, Troy. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to our um, introduction to drill sewing. So there's a couple of reasons we're running this um, Zoom meeting. One is as an industry, um, we certainly want to um, uh, head down this way of drill sewing, all about water use efficiency. Um, so there's potential for um, yeah, water savings and, and uh, with our uh, productivity, it, um, yeah, it's an increase in water use efficiency. The other reason we're running it is uh, we did a poll at the pre-season meetings and there was still 25% of those uh, participants that uh, weren't confident with drill sewing. And we had 40% um, who weren't confident with doing delayed permanent water. So uh, they're the reasons we, uh, we thought we'd uh, run this Zoom meeting. And um, yeah, as Annie said, we want it uh, very uh, conversational, lots of interaction. So certainly, um, yeah, type something in the chat box or put your hand up as um, Annie said. So um, we've had a malfunction already. I can't get onto the next screen. So we'll start again. Believe it or not, we, we did have a practice run. <laughs> it worked perfectly, didn't it, Mark? Uh, but anyhow, so just to, to get going, uh, what we can do is, as I said, we want this uh, to be interactive uh, today. Yeah, so we're gonna generally um, talk about we want to know what you want to know about drill sewing, um, why drill sew, calendar of operations for drill sewing, uh, paddock layouts and infrastructure. So we'll touch on that. Um, what's the ideal setup? Um, key steps to high yielding drill sewing rice. So we'll run over some practical steps um, of sewing and establishment and the significance of sowing dates and the relationship between sowing rates, water and nutrition management. So Mark will cover off on that. Then we also have got a case study of a grower who, um, who changed from dry broadcast over to um, drill sowing as well. So um, if we just want to, so there's a couple of ways, so how we can understand what you want to talk about is you can put them in the chat box or we can just go around the group. It is a pretty big group. Um, so maybe, yeah, or if you want to put your hand up and say there's something in particular that you want to um, ask to touch on, would be good. So you just want to type in the chat box now what you just want to know so we can ensure we cover it. How are we going, Annie? Are we getting a few in the chat box? No, no questions at the moment. Sorry, Troy. All right. Well, we'll share with you what we uh, think is important. So, yeah, that's what we really wanted to know from you is who, why, how, what and where. So what do you exactly want to know? So. Uh, just to get us started, so some of you, is, uh, obviously some people are already drill sewing um, and just want to know some more um, uh, tips and tricks of how they can do it better. But for those of you who are considering drill sewing for the first time, I thought it worth refreshing on uh, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, drill sewing. So as we look down that list there, uh, the advantages of um, drill sowing is rotation of our herbicides compared to our aerial and our uh, dry broadcast crops. You've got less aquatic weeds, 
Uh, you have no snails, which um, I see some snails about already in um, the channels, etc. So they're going to be an issue this year. Um, no bloodworm slash earthworm issues. Uh, and once again, there's lots of mozzies around. So I'd say bloodworms are going to be pretty prevalent this year in your um, aerial sand crops. Uh, lower water use, lower herbicide costs, um, lower cost of production, less lodging, uh, more trafficability after harvest. So easy if you want to do some double cropping. Uh, the, the ground is firmer and dries out quicker, so you can uh, easy to sow a winter crop. Uh, no slime issues, no duck issues. Once again, uh, New South Wales DPI released their, um, their wildlife numbers and they've doubled since last year. Last year, the ducks have, so they're going to be a major issue this year. Uh, it's also you can manage the uh, height of the plant a bit better, so you can have a shorter plant, uh, which enables it um, easy to protect it from the cold damage during microspores, so to get the uh, 25 centimetres uh, above the um, growing point of the plant. No muddy water issues and a higher gross margin, as you can uh, do all the management practices yourself such as sowing, spraying and top dressing. Don't have to rely on the plane as much. Some disadvantages, uh, some say decrease in yield. I've got a question mark there because it's not the case. Um, there's no, certainly in all the data that we've looked at and Mark, if you want to comment, um, you know, there's high yielding uh, aerial sowing crops, there's high yielding drill sowing crops. It's um, all, uh, all the methods are just as good as each other. It's about um, doing them well. So uh, some people say there's a little bit more labor involved and certainly barnyard grass control is an, is an issue. So, um, so in the chat box, someone said there's plenty of chemicals that can be used in drill sowing compared to the shortage of aerial chemicals. So that's a valid point this year. So yeah, um, thanks for that. So I just want to give you an overview of the sort of the operations of, of a drill sown crop. So particularly for those who haven't done it before. So, um, so in autumn is when you really should be preparing the ground. Uh, so that's, you know, where you run a laser bucket over it or you run a wide board. So that's really important to get a nice level uh, surface with no dips and hollows where water will, um, will uh, lie so you don't want any low spots at all so it's really important and it's important for to have a nice uh, even surface to get that water on and off as quickly as possible uh, then so in september or october or it could be august just depending on what sort of weeds and that grow on your um, autumn prepared seed bed so you certainly want to keep that clean over winter and then as we go into spring you want to do your pre-sowing knockdown spray. So that's certainly now, if you're looking to spray in the next couple of weeks and you've got a few, uh, some greenery there, you certainly want to give that a knockdown uh, spray to have a nice clean seed bed. Um, and then, yeah, so in October, certainly Mark will talk about the sowing windows as we go through, but this is just an overview of your sort of management practices. You'll sow in October and you have your first flush. And we, after our first flush, we all, always do a, a post-flush pre-emergent three-way herbicide um, spray. Then we have a second flush. And as you can see, I hope you can see my cursor. So after the second flush, certainly got the, the um, plant, the seed emerging. Then we've got a third flush, flush and um, we continue on until um, yeah, about three leaf stage. And that's when we'll do the, apply our urea pre, pre permanent water in mid to late November. So, or, or if you're doing delayed permanent water, that could be you know mid to uh, late December. So, and then we'll do a um, also pre permanent water or post just post permanent water. You've got to ensure there is water there for the second grass spray. So once again, that's anywhere from mid-November to mid-December, depending whether you just do conventional drill sown or you do delay permanent water. Then we uh, like to have five to 10 centimetres of water on there until PI. 
uh, which we want in the first two weeks of January. That's our aim. And once again, Mark will touch on that more in more depth later on. And we uh, do our top dressing of urea after we've done our tissue test and understand what the requirements are. And then we lift our water to 25 centimetres post PI. So certainly once we apply that permanent water, it's the same management practices as our aerial sewing for those people who are just swapping over or haven't done drill sewing before. So the, the, the differences are in an establishment. So just many people say, what's, uh, what's the difference between drill sewing and delayed permanent water? So I've got two slides here to try and illustrate that. Um, so conventional drill sewing is generally, you'll do three flushes and then go to permanent water at the three leaf stage. So one, two, three. So as soon as the plant's at three leaf stage, you can go to permanent water or, you know, um, yeah, so about mid-November generally, you'll go to permanent water. Whereas delayed permanent water, we'll see you know, four or five flushes before we go to permanent water. And that permanent water is, when we go to permanent water, that's um, it's certainly in the tillering um, stage, vegetative growth stage. So as we can see, it was, and also you will sow uh, about a week earlier than conventional drill. So we've got one, so these little blue uh, diagrams are an indication of a flush of water. So we've got one, two, three, four. And then as we can see, um, we've got lots of tillering happening. And then that's when we go to permanent water. So that's the difference. Um, and that's sort of greater than 55 days uh, is another way of describing delayed permanent water. water. So with that, just want to um, touch on, you know, what's the best practice? What's the, uh, what's the key to it, uh, to drill sowing? And we've tried to simplify it. Obviously there's lots of information. There's growing guides, there's rice crop protection guides. There's a mountain of information. So last year, the rice extension team and grow services and industry. So DPI got together and thought, how can we, refine this to some key steps. And for drill sowing, we come up with uh, 10 key steps. And the more uh, key steps you achieve, the higher the yield. So last year we also did, uh, the rice extension team monitored 85 uh, crops. So we intensely monitored them, we measured them at every uh, growth stage and the, each key step. And it was clear the results that, yeah, the more, um, key steps you achieved, the uh, higher the yield. So this, uh, this is what it looks like. It's an A4 page um, with the key steps. So yes, the ladder indicates, this ladder here indicates the more steps you get correct throughout the crop stage, the higher the yield you'll get. So, um, so just so everyone can read that, we'll go down to, I'll just highlight a little bit. So what are the key steps for drill sowing? The number one key step, and that's what is about consolidated seed bed on a good layout with no low spots, which maximize emergence and allows timeliness of operations. And we'll talk about that timeliness a lot in this um, presentation. It really is the key to, um, to successful um, yielding, uh, high yielding uh, rice crops. So, and timeliness of operation goes for all sowing methods as well. So first of all, so that's where we said, you know, we sh you should have had your um, paddock prepared back in, um, in autumn. So now it should be nice and firm, uh, very trafficable. And it's just a matter of lowering the, uh, spraying them weeds out. Step two and three is about establishment, plant within the sowing window, depending on the variety and the region. So whether you're in MIA or whether you're in uh, Western Murray Valley. So obviously they're available, them sowing windows are available on the New South Wales DPI variety guides. And once again, Mark will touch a little bit more than on that as well, go in a little bit more depth. So yeah, this is certainly an overview. Um, so yeah, 120, 150 kilos of seed a hectare, depending on the variety to achieve, we're aiming for about that 100 to 200 plants per square metre. Uh, the key step number four is 
post flush and pre emergent. So apply that three way mix application post flush and pre emergent that we showed in the that we saw in the last um, infograph. So this and once again, so this goes back to why you need a consolidated seabed so you can get that that timely application on. Then your second flush has to be within three days of step of the key step, the fourth key step. Uh, three days of the three-way mix being uh, applied to activate the, activate the herbicides. At this, in the second flush, it's also important, this is the most critical time for the water to get on and off the bay. So you don't want any, you want to minimise the ponding. So as a rule of thumb, we're saying maximum 18 hours. Um, then step seven is achieved panical initiation between the 1st and 14th of January and mark, sorry, I missed one. Step six is apply sufficient end to the dry soil pre-permanent water. Uh, and then them rates are dependent on variety and paddock history and your location. So it's very important that point is that you apply uh, pre-permanent water. You want a, dr a dry um, seed bed. So that's that way you maximize your end efficiency. Uh, yeah, so step seven is achieve panicle initiation between the 1st and the 14th of January. And Mark will talk a little bit about how um, we can ensure that we uh, hit that target of uh, the first two weeks in January. Uh, early microspore, really important that we get uh, our water depth 25 to 30 centimetres uh, within 12 to 14 days after PI. It's a very critical um, that is particularly uh, in a year where you have some uh, cold weather or cold snaps. So that, that water will buffer the temperature by about eight degrees, seven to eight degrees. So very important. Uh, head emergence to scout for your armyworms and treat if needed. And step 10 is, is drainage using weather data and forecasts to drain on time to harvest in about between that 18 and 22% for maximum uh, quality. So maximum whole grain yield wasn't an issue this year because of uh, the cool weather. So we um, yeah, would have said 95% uh, of crops were harvested in within that um, them parameters. Uh, we don't have any questions, any? No questions yet. No questions, so yeah, don't be afraid to just unmute yourself and yell out if you've got a question or, um, put in the chat box or put your hand up. So, uh, so yeah, one of the main questions people say, you know, what sort of layout do you need? Uh, so we've got some, I, I guess, all layouts I've seen drill saying uh, um, su successfully achieved on all layouts, but it takes a lot more management um, in, in a, a layout that isn't um, what we're about to describe. So if you're less experienced, you obviously want to try and start off with a very good layout. Um, so yeah, it's all about the, uh, you know, between uh, any layout that should be you know, between one and 2000 is fine. Um, and a slope of one and 1500, that's where you uh, can have some issues with getting the water on and off. So that's where you really need to ensure that you got, um, you know, really good, uh, if it's a uh, side ditches and uh, good, infrastructure to get that water on and off. So high flows on and enable that water to get off. The operating level and the supply channel should be, you know, so you, you wanna have good command of your paddock so you can get that water depth on at microspore. Um, ensure clean and adequate capacity of supply and draining channels, as you can see in the, in the photo on the right. So really, really good bankless channel layout, um, high, high capacity, high flow um, structures. We've got a question around um, seed depth at the planting. Yep, so we will we will cover that next. Yep, I'll cover that one. And the next one is, Troy, can you comment on different rates and practices of starter for this seed? Of... So we'll leave that one for the minute until we... that question from Hayden, until Mark will talk about that. So can you keep an eye on them two questions? Any, I know we'll, we'll cover the seeding depth one for sure. But the second one, we'll cover it when Mark does his presentation. Thank you. No, that's the idea. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, the height difference between 
the highest and the lowest points of the bay should not exceed five centimetres. So that's for ease of water management. That's ensure that you um, can get that water depth right as well. Flow rates for culverts, pipes, uh, stop heights and widths should be four times the base size to ensure adequate flow rates. So the example we've got here, if you've got a four hectare bay, ideally, this isn't you know always possible, but if we're looking at you know uh, utopia, you, you'd want 16 megs a day going onto that um, four hectare bay. And then you yeah, ensure your rice banks are 40 centimetres above the highest point in the bay. Um, so bay size, you know, I've seen anything from 12 hectares down to, you know, your one and a half hectares. Once again, you, you get up to them 12 hectare bays, you've got to have plenty of water running on and um, the ability to get it off. So uh, you probably have a, a double bankless channel system or you'd have, um, you know, a big step between your bays. So uh, to really ensure that water can get on and off. So um, very important. Obviously, you, your top bay and your bottom bay, you want them smaller than the rest of your bays, um, particularly your bottom bay if it's smaller, so you can catch all the, um, all the not so much the runoff, but it's, um, if you've got to have the same size bay at the bottom, you'll have too much uh, drainage water. So to reduce your drainage water, your bottom bay, you certainly, um, you want smaller than the, the rest. Um, so yeah, as I said, of uh, bankless channels, um, you know, um, zero grade with steps in it, all work. I've seen contours work, but their uh, difficulty in management is a lot harder. It's certainly you get uh, more uneven establishment, and um, you know, which then has implications as we go go through the growing season. So. Uh, the main thing is that you've got no low spots where it will pond because that's certainly where you'll um, lose some plant stand and also becomes issues when you're trying to um, do your spray. So you'll um, put bog marks, etc., through it. Uh, also, when you go to drain, that'll be a wet spot, obviously, as well at the end of the season. So uh, that's, that's that one. Um, so here's just an example of a, a well laid out um, bankless channel system. So at the foreground here, we've got a rollover bank. So I'd encourage uh, the ideal setup once these rollover banks just for ease of access when you're doing your spraying and your um, spreading pre-permanent water. It's just a labor saving, a time saving. So, so certainly, yeah. So we've got a very good um, tow furrows, very clean, very good bank. And um, as you can say, see this has had the bucket ran over it. Uh, so it's excellent surface. It obviously just needs a spray um, pre-sowing to clean up these um, bits of greenery. But that's certainly what we're looking for, for just as a visual for you. Uh, as I said, so, so where are we at now? If, if you did miss your autumn um, preparation, and you are looking at sort of still drill sowing. It's important to try and take them low spots out uh, by wide, wide bordering, uh, running the wide board over it, uh, um, and yeah, trying to get that consolidated seabed. So once again, I uh, have seen people work up ground this time of the year um, and still grow a successful crop. But the problem with uh, having worked up ground this time of the year is two things. Particularly if you use a tine seeder, you can get seed sink. So the, the seed will, as you, when you flush it, the seed will drop down um, where the tine is. So therefore your sowing depth gets too deep. The other thing is traffic and ability. So um, you're only got, um, you know, at sometimes it can be just a matter of days to get that spray on before your rice between your ground drying out and the rice emerging. So that's why it's really important to have that firm seed bed. So it's doable, uh, but yeah, certainly if you've just got a stubble paddock, um, I'd be, and you haven't done anything to it, it's worth running the wide board over it um, just to take out any of them um, low spots. Seeding depth, so that's where we're targeting for three centimetres. Uh, this is also, this graph in here is to illustrate um, 
it, particularly if you're using a, a tine seeder. So we know when we use a tine seeder, obviously we get the little grooves, the hills. So we've got the hills here and a little groove. So what it's important to do to these three centimetres, particularly if it's a slaking soil, what you'll see is the, these little hills will wash down into here or the soil slake down into here and it will increase our seeding depth. So when it comes to seeding depth, yeah, depth, we're after that sort of three to five centimetres, depending on soil type, depending on, and I've got a couple of photos I'll show in a minute, depending on, um, yeah, whether you get crusting or not, but certainly three centimetres is a good guide. Um, but you've got to make sure, as I said, it's um, that seeding depth doesn't increase if you're using a time machine and we get the tops of these hills and it's a slaking soil and they run down in there because you'll end up getting five centimetres. So on that point, uh, you know, disc seeders leave the ground a lot, single disc seeders leave the ground more even. So it, it does, uh, it is easier to get a more accurate seed depth. But once again, I've seen the whole breadth of seeders used successfully. Um, it's about knowing your soil type, about setting it, taking the time to set your um, seeder up correctly. Uh, once again, a time machine, it's about not going too fast and uh, you're double checking. So um, that's certainly what we want to uh, achieve there. Um, the other thing is with a time machine. So yeah, this is showing the seed depth. Uh, so we do have a little bit of a crust in in this soil type, and you can. So the re, other reason it's important to place your seed below the uh, crust is, is this crust dries out uh, and it runs out of moisture, and we don't get emergence. So it'll end up uh, just staying in the crust and drying out and not emerging. So that's certainly this is ideal what we want to see. Um, so once again, you can see. Um, plenty of uh, plants there. Uh, this is sowing right at uh, 130 kilos. So it's certainly plenty of seeds there. Um, so yeah, that's a, uh, hopefully it gives you a visual of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, here's another one. This soil wasn't a crusting soil, but once again, you see how the, the top, you know, centimetres or two centimetres will dry out. And then, so it's important to keep the seed in the moisture. Um, there, so be a very friable soil. Um, soil, this one, and um, yeah, just to try and give you another, another visual. So this is on a, a redder um, soil. Um, once again, it's it's um, you can see how it's drying out very quickly. Um, but yeah, just certainly with a single disc seeder, it'll crack open, and these will pop up through the cracks. So. Um, so yeah, just touching on that point, what is better, a disc or a seed or a tine seeder, um, all work. It comes down a little bit about um, uh, your experience. So it's certainly, if you haven't drill sown before, I would encourage you to either get a lot of advice off someone who has or use a contractor. Um, is what I'd be encouraging you to do. But yeah, so, so single, single disc seeder works. Uh, the advantage of them is that about that seed placement. It's about keeping the surface uh, even. Uh, but once again, you know, here's a um, time machine that works just as well. This picture up here was a time machine, uh, a janky, uh, just was a time. And it's about knowing your soil. So. This paddock was um, grazed hard by sheep, uh, sprayed out and then direct drilled. And it's just a redder soil that was, um, that they yeah, had the ability to, um, yeah, just a, the lighter soil. It's certainly, um, if you're heavy black gray soil and it, it's very cloddy, you probably couldn't do get away with that. So it's about knowing your soil type. Um, and then, yeah, so this crop went on to average 13.2 uh, uh, tonnes. So, um, you know, it works just as well, no matter, um, it's not about the machine, it's about your, it's more about your field preparation 
about your paddock preparation, having that good um, firm seed bed is probably a, a key point. So yeah, that's why I just, um, the, both types of work, work well, but perform better with well-prepared paddocks. Um, know your soil type and your moisture levels as well. Um, and then how much experience do you have? So that's what I'd say there. So some of the disadvantages and what you've got to be careful with, with the, um, I said, actually, I'll just go and do time first. So this is once again, giving you a visual about the ridges uh, with a time machine. So also what can happen, it can uh, inhibit the water getting away as well. So obviously the, uh, in this situation and most situations, the you um, sow against the slope of the bay. So the water can get stuck in these little grooves and not drain off. So the slope of the bay goes from the left to the right. And obviously we're sowing um, the opposite way. So that's, it. that's something to keep an eye out for. And it's something you've got to manage with a time machine. Um, so... Yeah, so these are before flooding and before emergence. But it's still got enough plants up there. Once again, it's probably a, comes down to a soil type, so a lighter, redder, redder soil. Um, so that helps you get away with it. Where you really get caught in this situation is if you have a rain event. So you're flush, and then the water takes a bit to get away out of these grooves, and then you get a rain event soon after. That's when you can have some um, plant deaths, and that's... That's the risk um, with that machine. Here's a, once again, so a time machine going straight in and you can see the big clods here. So they're, they're problematic. Plants get stuck underneath them. So the issue here isn't the time machine. If I was in a group, I'd be asking you, what is the issue? If I could see you all, issue is paddock preparation. So that's the problem there. It's not the machine, it's paddock preparation. So that's what I want to illustrate there. Uh, once again, so good paddock preparation. So um, this is drilled straight into a um, canola stubble. Uh, we all know what our soils are like after canola. They're, they're very friable. And once again, perfect um, establishment there. So um, paddock preparation is key. Uh, one of the things to look out with your disc seeder is that if it's the moisture, if there's too much moist, moisture in the soil, it won't close the, the slot, the, the groove. Um, so that leaves the seed exposed. It'll dry it out uh, quicker than it can germinate. And also um, there's an issue when you come back to do your three-way sprays if the, um, if the germinated seed is exposed to gramoxone. So it'll kill the plant. So, so that's something to look out, out, out for for disc seeders. And, the other thing is it's really important to adjust your machine. So um, once again, it's you know, many machines are as good as they're set up. So you've got to take that time to get it right for your soil type, for your moisture um, and your sewing machine. So that's something to look out for um, there. So in here, so this is just to, uh, I guess, give you some more visual of um, what can happen and what, what it's important to do. So on the crusting soils, so this paddock was um, lasered just before um, it was sown. So the soil wasn't settled. Uh, and then what we're seeing after sowing and after irrigation, um, yeah, a lot of crusting happened, a lot of slaking. So in this case, it's really important to let the soil crack open. So when it cracks open, that's when the um, rice will pop its little head up through through these cracks. So, and then this is how quickly it grows and can change. So this is after, so that's had um, two flushes and this is after the third flush, you can see it's, it's greening right up and comes right through. But just in that situation, it's really um, important to, um, yeah, to let the, the soil naturally crack. And particularly with um, disc machines, they will crack open along a line and yeah, let them come up through like that. And this is perfection. So this is what we're aiming for. So a really good seed bed. You can see it's flat. There's no um, hollows, great establishment. 
And so that's what we're aiming to achieve. So is there any questions on that sort of establishment sewing? Because now we're gonna, I'm gonna hand over to Mark and he's gonna run us through his presentation. So just while we're handing over, if there's any questions on them, first couple of topics, um, I'm pretty sure I covered the, the sewing depth one well enough, but so if you wanna share your screen, Mark, and we can. No worries, thank you. Just um, just make a comment on uh, on what you said there, Troy. That so the ideal seed depth is about thirty mil. A couple of reasons for that is as Troy went through with um, uh, with a, a you know disc versus time and so on. But um, thirty mil is gives you the time, uh, so it, it puts the seed into moisture. Um, good soil seed contact is more important than you know whether you have got times or disc or whatever. But that uniform placement is um, important from a point of view of, of herbicide management as well, or weed control, and particularly with drill sowing, where we're looking to come back, uh, you know, post flush, but bef before the rice comes up. So post flush, pre emergent, um, is, it, that window is very tight, uh, and 30 mil gives you, you know, hopefully the time to traffic your paddock after um, after your flush. Uh, but before your rice comes up. So uh, so that 30 mil is about the ideal depth. The coleoptile length of a rice plant is uh, is only about 40 mil. So um, there is issues of going too deep. And last year did see a few issues where we, um, people were chasing moisture and uh, and we had that cold start, cold windy start and, um, and, uh, and they had issues with uh, establishment because they went in too deep. So... Uh, and then last year, particularly with, um, you know, any crop that was delayed and, uh, and um, uh, basically come unstuck. So it was a bit of a, a cliff face with the yield and uh, the yield decline and, uh, and that, you know, having to re sow then was, was quite costly. So, um, so disc versus time is always a great argument and uh, I've seen excellent results with both. Um, again, it's that seed placement, that uniform seed depth and, uh, and good soil seed contact. So that's more important than whether it's a disc or a tine. Um, I see there's people on the calls that have got both and that have a fair bit of experience with drill sowing. Um, and equally, there's people that, that uh, as far as I know, haven't drill sowed. So, um, so yeah, it is about that paddock prep. Clodiness that Troy had the image of before, um, they did get stuck under clods, but also there's an issue of weed control there that um, you don't actually get the contact uh, or, or good soil coverage, and um, um, and you'll, that's where your barnyard will come from underneath these clods and within these clods. Crusting soil, I was just uh, I'll make a comment on the crusting soil. That's there's a lot of our soils do crust, um, whether you're aerial or, or or drill sowing. They're a bit of a challenge um, when they slake and turn to slop. It's always hard to get the establishment with aerial sowing. Uh, that, that they can't sort of establish their routing properly um, for quite a while and really susceptible particularly to wind. But drill sowing, it's, a, it's um, a more common mistake to overflush crusty soils than um, be, be conservative with your flushing if you like. As soon as they crust, people go, oh, the, the rice can't come up through that crust, so I'll flush it again. Um, normally we're fairly early in the season, we can get fairly cool October weather. Um, when you flush, you cool the ground down again, <clears throat> and your your plant's struggling to come up over under a crust, and you you continually flush it, uh, and you're cooling that ground down, and and you're um, you know you're essentially slowing that that uh, coming through. So ideally, walk away from it for a while. Um, if you do get if, times where um, um, you know, you're not, it's not cracking down the, the disc line as, as that image was Troy put up before. Um, I would wait until that plant is actually concertining, concertining underneath the crust. Uh, give it a quick flush then and it'll just pop up straight out behind the water. So, um, so the challenge uh, there. What do you mean by concertining? I thought you had an image before, so I was waiting for it to come up. But uh, so when you, when I, you. I do, but I hit it. <laughs> okay. When you, when you actually pull the crust up uh, and you can see the plant, it's hit the crust and it's sort of, you know, starting to, to um, basically fold within itself. Um, 
that's the point to flush it. Uh, if you flush before then, all you're doing is cooling the ground down and slowing everything down. So, um, so yeah, just be wary of that. Your plant will be in moisture anyway, so try out that image before where that top couple of centimetres is dried out, but the root is actually sitting in black wet soil. So take notice of that more than what the what that surface is doing. So um, once it's out of the ground, it's, uh, you know, it's a relatively easy crop to manage, so uh, particularly on those crusting soils. Um, there was, uh, Hayden, what, would, what were you asking about the... Um, the fur to start a fur and this cedars. I assume it was, do you mind making a comment on that? Oh, you there? I see he's trying to. No, okay. So I'm assuming Hayden, you're talking about- um, there, there, there. Yep, Gamma. And then there is another question after that. Right. I just assume he's talking about um, this cedars concentrate the, uh, if you imagine an air cedar, you've got a, a wide band um, where um, your, your seed gets blown into and your fertiliser gets blown into. And, uh, and the fertiliser, there's a physical separation between your fertiliser and seed. In, uh, in disc seeding, and particularly with um, double disc seeding, you, um, it, it's concentrated down the slot and um, uh, you do get direct contact with, uh, with seed and fertiliser. And that, that germinating seed, the emerging coleoptol, is quite susceptible to fertiliser burn. So um, it's probably not really a drama with the particularly MAP type mixes and, uh, and even DA type mixes with uh, DOPs high in nitrogen um, at, you know, 100, 120 kilos um, um, and even 150. But if you, you know, you're going that 180 and, and better, it, uh, it is something to be, um, yeah, to be aware of there. I uh, hope I've covered that off, Hayden. I'm, I'm assuming that's what it was. Certainly your rares, sulfate, sulfate and manures and stuff, completely different story. You don't really want to have that direct um, soil seed contact. So, um, so yeah, so just be wary of that. Um, and what was the other question? Sorry. Uh, so Jer Jeremy's asked, has anyone used a grader board after sowing with a time machine to level the field? So to my experience, no. But Mark, have you? Haven't seen a, a grader board. Certainly rollers are good. I mean, if you haven't got press wheels, they're, yeah. they're the ideal. Um, and, and also the ideal to keep that continue that, uh, that, um, 30 mil continuous seed placement um, just to, to ride over any contours and whatnot. Um, yeah, you've got to be wary with the grader board, I think, in that you, you've only got 30 mil to play with um, and you, you just pull seed up everywhere. Um, but certainly rollers, rollers just to, to consolidate that seed bed, um, get the good soil seed contact again and, uh, and flatten all your clods out and you get a lot better coverage with your, your herbicides. So, um, yeah, don't, uh, don't be afraid to roll. Um, if I can work out how to share my screen now, I will. Uh... Just before you um, head into that, Mark, I just had a question around um, row spacing as well. So um, from a row spacing perspe perspective, best to sow between 18 and 27 centimetres, and which is seven to about 10 and a half inches for anybody that hasn't done it before. Yeah, and good point. And again, it's a continual um, discussion about this one. That most would say the narrower the better, and you know, seven inches is ideal. Um, Brian Dunn's done a heap of work on row spacing, and and ten inches also fine. Um, you know, ten inch I think is is pretty well about the limit that that most people want to work with. Not so much. You, you do get a lot of um, in, inter row or intra row or within the row it gets quite crowded. So even though you've got a lot of space between the rows. Um, and also if you have a miss anywhere, the plant won't compensate that 20 inches, but it will compensate that 14. So um, people say you're better off to canopy quick, quicker to, uh, to get better weed control. Um, I sort of, you know, I, it's yes, it's a fair argument, but equally it's that early weed control that is your important, is, is your cheapest and most effective. Um, and, uh, and that's when your plant's, you know, very small and you've probably got 
you know, ninety five percent bare soil. So, um, so yeah, it's not not you, your your rice isn't going to compete with well established barnyard. So you've got to control that barnyard early. So we've got plenty of options for that. Um, so uh, yeah, so seven to ten inch, um, ten inch. You know, everyone a lot of people on a ten inch machine working in with winter crop and and dry land and whatnot. So um, so it uh, it works out equally for sure. Uh, happy with that? Yep. Excuse me, I'll work this out. They come up, Annabelle? Not yet. <laughs> yep. You can see the right screen. No, I can't see anything yet, Mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I can't see anything. So, so I just had a comment about after the uh, about using a wide board after uh, sowing. So, uh, someone has experience. Yes, they have to knock to uh, knock down some of the um, clumps. But once again, I think that. It, what we're saying is it goes back to paddock preparation. Um, so it's important that you, you know, if you're getting big clumps or clods or whatever, it's yeah, your paddock preparation. So I understand why some people do it. Um, it if you drill something straight into a partial paddock, you'll have some clods. Um, but yeah, so I guess what we're trying to um, talk about today is what's best practice. So certainly it's a, yeah, if you got your paddock preparation correct, you um, shouldn't need to do that. So, oh, you've just muted yourself, Troy. Yep, it's back to you. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Tell me that screen's up. Yep, yep. Thank goodness for that. All right. <laughs> um, so, morning, everybody. Good to uh, good to see somebody on the call. It's fantastic. So. Um, I'm just going to uh, touch on some of the management of drill sowing, particularly compared to aerial or, or dry broadcast or, or water seeded. I'm just going to lump together. Um, this is a table from uh, the Rizik Growing Guide. All the growing guides have, have this table that Brian Dunn put together from, uh, from the DPI. And um, I want to particularly, hang on, I'll just uh, work this out. Particularly look at um, uh, sowing dates and uh, and compared to aerial versus drill versus versus DPW. Um, the reason that Brian's got or delayed permanent water, the reason Brian's got these sowing dates is to hit this PI date uh, in those first two weeks of January. And um, and essentially the, the best probability of getting the best weather during microspore and flowering is, um, is to have PI in the first two weeks of January. And certainly last year really highlighted that. Um, the crops that had PI the first two weeks of January versus uh, a couple of weeks delay, and particularly as it went into February, um, was, was a you know, five, six tonne yield difference. Um, normally you would get a, a slight yield decline. Last year it fell off a cliff. So it really highlighted the importance of getting that PI date within the first two weeks of January. And that's by far uh, what you're aiming to do at, at, uh, at sowing dates um, than anything else. So your October weather can be highly variable. You can have a lot of heat, you can have a lot of cold, you can have a lot of wind. Um, it's not so much the, um, you know, when October, the, the October sowing date is to give uh, this effect here. And, um, and that's the whole reason for it. The key difference between um, your aerial sowing versus your drill sowing crops, uh, once you're, you're, you've put the seed in the water, you've got your foot in the accelerator and that's about it. You've got the nitrogen underneath there already. Um, your plant population will be what it will be. You've got limited control over that and limited control to manage it once it's up, uh, whether it's a, a thin population or a thick population. Um, but your sowing date is such that your PI date will fall into this. Um, Nate has got first flush here, not, uh, not your sowing date. So if you would normally aerial sow 
on the uh, on the 25th of October, that's really you should be have finished your first first flush on the 25th of October. Um, that's not the time to pull the group out and start sowing. So, um, so be be aware of that. And again, it's it's to get this PI date within the first two weeks of January. So. Every single crop that yielded well last year and, and by yielded well, um, yielded above its, its long-term average, regardless of the variety and regardless of the region, um, were sown early in the window uh, and all of them hit the PI um, within the first two weeks of January. There was though, plenty sown early in the window that didn't hit, that was, was delayed in PI and that's a few of the things that I want to address now about why that happens. Uh, and certainly more prevalent with drill sowing than aerial sowing. It gives us the ability to influence uh, when PI occurs, which is which is both a, a plus and a minus, a plus if you're aware of it though. So just, uh, just touching on a, a few things we can control. So sowing date is one, first flush date um, is, is obviously the first thing, which, uh, which you know, as a, as a Sort of pointed out that this is first flush rather than sowing. The um, the intervals between your flushes. Um, so Troy's hushed on delayed time of water versus just conventional drill sowing. Um, we were saying it's actually a disadvantage to overflush than underflush. Um, your weight suffering yields by pushing your flushes out um, at, at the vegetative phase, but you will push that maturity out. So. Um, be aware there are, there are people who will sow uh, back in, you know, first week of October and even earlier and uh, taking advantage of soil moisture or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, that's great, works well. Um, but be aware if you are very early that you've got the ability to actually push that maturity out to hit that PI those first two weeks of January. It's equally a disadvantage to have your PI date too early. Um, we do run into adverse weather or the probability of adverse weather earlier uh, is, is high. And particularly last year, there was a big cold snap if you hit PI um, earlier rather than, than later. But uh, it's more that you're, you can potentially get a lot of heat at flowering, um, which is then a, a disadvantage of both yield and quality. So. Um, so that, uh, that intervals between flushing, um, don't over flush, but if you're on time and um, um, you know, you, you've planted in the right window or you, you're established within that right window, then, uh, then don't under flush either because you, you don't want to push that maturity out. The third thing that'll push your maturity out is, um, is your permanent water date. So again, there's a reason that, that at uh, delayed permanent water crops are put in two weeks before drill sown crops, which are put in basically two weeks before aerial sown crops, so or 10 days. Um, um, because you are pushing your maturity out by, uh, by delaying that permanent water. Um, lots of advantages to delayed permanent water, and I'll touch on some of them, particularly with nitrogen um, and, uh, and water savings point of view. But, uh, but be aware that you are pushing that maturity out. So I'll just give you a quick example of, of two crops last year. Um, as I said, anything that hit PI late last year suffered in yield. Uh, there were two crops sown up in the MIA, two of the end crops. They were sown, um, they were both drill sown into the second week of December. So they were already probably two to three weeks outside of the window. Um, one was, was uh, flushed about four times. It uh, put on a, a Swag of nitrogen, it was filled up after Christmas, uh, hit PI around sort of um, early Feb and, uh, and just had monster cold snap at both microspore and flowering uh, and basically end up, it was a write off that uh, it wasn't worth putting a header into. Uh, the other crop was sown same time, uh, limited, limited himself, he knew it was already limited in yield. Um, so it was very conservative on nitrogen. Flushed it once, there was a lot of heat around then, um, popped out of the ground and basically filled up. Um, and his weed control was secondary to him. He actually treated it as an aerial sign crop and he, it was a, a Audrey and brew he put on. Um, so the weed control was very good, but so he didn't lock himself into the drill sign program. So the flexibility was there. Uh, but the key thing was he filled up straight away. He didn't, um, 
uh, push the nitrogen. So excess nitrogen can also delay maturity and, um, and yielded around eight tonne, uh, which was an exceptional result last year and an exceptional result, particularly uh, because it was done so late. So, it, uh, so the difference, you know, eight tonne versus basically uh, using the same bit of water and, uh, and you know, it was, a, it was basically straw. So a fantastic grass crop and that was about it. So, so you do have the ability to push that maturity out. So be, um, be very wary of that. But the advantages of that uh, are you've got that flexibility. So your, um, your plant, you've got, you're applying the, uh, the brake and the accelerator at the same time. As I mentioned before with aerial sewing, you've basically got your foot on the accelerator and it depends on sunshine and that's about it. Um, whereas with uh, with drill sewing, you can you can uh, push it ahead uh, by by um, you know by your flushes, by your irrigation management, by your nitrogen management. Your you can um, um, monitor your plant population and manage accordingly. Again, with aerial sewing crops, you can sow it at 150 kilos. That may mean you'll get establishment between 100 and 450, depending on uh, on you know how well things come up. With drill sowing, you can actually see uh, that, yes, I've got 150 plants a square metre, fantastic. I'll manage my nitrogen accordingly, or I've got 80 plants a square metre, or I've got 400 plants a square metre. Um, and if you do have 400 plants a square metre, one, you've got um, the potential to push that maturity out because it's too thick, um, but you can, you can delay... Um, not so much delay, you, you can be a bit more conservative on nitrogen, I suppose. You're still going to need nitrogen to yield, but it's possibly a better option to then uh, decrease your upfront nitrogen and uh, and look at putting more on later on so you don't get that monster big, um, thick vegetative growth that one will fall over and uh, until you'll get a lot of a lot of small heads uh, rather than fewer bigger heads, which are always going to be a better yielding crops. Um, Nitrogen application, I'm going to touch on a tick and some nitrogen use efficiency with drill sign compared to water seeded crops. Um, um, but basically you're looking to spread in front of the water. There was an example last year. Um, so we've all seen that variability in, in uh, application. So that straight line variability that we introduced within ourselves. Uh, and it's really, you know, you, you, you get a couple of tonne yield difference in those strips and equally you get variations in maturity. Um, and you're, you know, you've got one, one uh, 10 metre swath is, is ripe and the other 10 metre swath is still at 26% moisture. Um, so you're, that really upsets the quality and the harvestability of that crop. So, um, so to alleviate that straight line variability, it's like um, aerial side urea and you basically put uh, urea over a couple hundred acres within, you know, the one day, uh, but it took a week to get the water over it. So, just um, you, if you if you got a shower rain in amongst that, you're going to lose a lot of that urea. So just beware, uh, you know, or a heavy dew even, you're going to use a lot of that urea, lose a lot. So um, so just spread in front of the water, and you know, buy in front of the water, sort of a, a day or two in advance, um, and you've got that ability to do it. Equally, you've got the ability to address variability. Um, pre-permanent water. So the biggest bang for the buck is, is, uh, is addressing that variability before you put the big lick of nitrogen on. Again, with aerial sun, you've got the nitrogen underneath. Uh, you're trying to write the variability at PI. You're really only getting 20, 25% of your yield difference at PI. So the biggest bang will be upfront urea. So, um, you know, you look at imagery uh, before you put that permanent water on and and um, you can address variability uh, at that stage, which is which is going to be your best um, best yield result. Um, and equally with NIR tissue testing, you can um, you know you look at your imagery and that with aerial sound or or drill sound crops, but you look at that imagery and you can see where to test. And you can see your wet points, you can see your uh, your good points, and um, uh, and then how to address it. You've sort of got a double whammy of uh, of addressing variability within field. Um, there's a couple of slides here I'm just going to look at. Um, Confluence of Brian Dunn again. So again, this is on the, it, within the Rosette Growing Guide. Um, and the reason I wanted to look at this one, um, this, is, this is looking at 
uh, potential yield given various nitrogen uptakes at PI. So, <clears throat> and uh, and then and then putting on uh, different rates of nitrogen to see how you can address that uh, that um, the yield or what influence um, nitrogen at PI does has on the yield. So the the uh, red line you apply no nitrogen at PI. <clears throat> the yellow line, sorry, the green line you you're putting on. 60 units of nitrogen, so around 130 odd kilos of urea. And here's about 250 kilos of urea, the purple lines. Uh, so it's 250 kilos of urea at PI. So, so not, uh, not up front. So if you look at a nitrogen uptake here of around 50, not sure why we've got these odd numbers here. But, so we're looking at nitrogen uptake of around 50 and you apply 250 kilos of urea at PI, uh, you, cause you'll still get an eight ton crop. Uh, but the potential of that crop is around 15 tonne. So uh, I've seen crops that are around the 70 mark at, at, uh, at PI. So this is your, again, your end uptake. You can still yield 12 tonne by applying 250 kilos of urea. Um, but again, you will never hit the potential of that crop. So, so ideally, we're looking at a PI nitrogen uptake of around 100, 100 120. And that brings you up to this level. Um, and um, and then being able to apply uh, nitrogen from that point. So uh, again, this is a, a little to do with um, drill sowing compared to aerial sowing, but it's an important point to uh, to look at when you're addressing variability uh, within your crop. Uh, and again, you've got more flexibility to do that in a in a drill sowing situation. Um, but this was leading on to nitrogen efficiency gains um, or nitrogen efficiency application uh, in drill zone or, or dry broadcast, uh, drill zone or delayed permanent water compared to water seeded crops. Um, when, when you're applying nitrogen under um, uh, a flooded condition, the the um, efficiency of that nitrogen is around 40 to 60%. So if you're dry broadcasting and you spread your air on top and then, and then water it in, uh, you're probably around that 40%. If you're uh, drilling it under the ground, you know, 10 centimetres deep or whatever, and then you just uh, apply permanent water, for, as in you, you fly seed in, um, you're probably up around that 60% mark. With, uh, with drill sowing, if you're um, filling up at around that three to five leaf um, and you spread your your um, urea onto dry soil and then you fill up, that's a highly efficient form of nitrogen. You're probably up around that 70%. Um, but if you spread it into, you know, wetter soil or you get a shower rain or you get a heavy dew um, or you spread it three days in advance and um, so you, you're down into that sort of 50% water. With delayed permanent water, you've got a lot bigger crop. Um, so as you put, you've got a well-tilled crop, you've got a big root system. You've, uh, you're probably looking at, you know, 60, 70% canopy cover. Um, you've got a lot of protection from the wind. And, um, and as soon as you put that permanent water on, um, you've got a big root system that'll suck that nitrogen up. So your efficiency of, of nitrogen application is, uh, is up around the sort of, you know, a lot higher, so 70, 75%. So, so the best of delayed permanent water versus the worst of of uh, aerial or, or water seeded, even the best of aerial or water seeded, you know, we have the potential to drop those nitrogen rates uh, and be aware of that because you can actually over fertilize um, crops by putting on the same amount of, of nitrogen. Almost invariably when we talk about the best yields, the first question people ask is how much nitrogen they put on. And, um, and it's not about how much they put on, it's about how effective they put it on. So you'll hear of crops that have put on half a tonne of nitrogen per hectare. Um, and equally you'll hear where they've put on 300 kilos of, of urea, uh, yeah, half a tonne of, of urea to the hectare. Equally they've put on 300 kilos of urea and, um, and the 300 kilos of urea will, will almost invariably yield a lot more. Uh, but it's not so much how much they put on, it's how effective they've been or how efficient it's been taken up. Um, uh, and that's just, kind of, I'm going to jump back a bit on the, um, so as I say, we're aiming for a PI in uptake of around 120 odd. Um, and this is, uh, this is for Rizik. 
a little bit uh, less for, for some of the varieties, but basically that 120 is where we want to be. Um, up here, and where we get 200 plus, I remember a number of years ago, we had a crop that was around 300. Wasn't necessarily because he put on huge licks of nitrogen, he just put it on, it was his first year of drill sowing. Um, and um, it, it was a big lick of nitrogen, but it was highly efficient in its, in its take up. Um, and he also obviously had a fair bit of nitrogen already within the soil um, because to get a, a, a 300 is huge. You, are, uh, you will decline in yield when you go too high. Uh, and at 300, you are actually, there's a, and I don't know if it's really well understood, I was speaking to um, uh, Laurie Lawn about it, who's, who's forgotten more about rice than, than I'll certainly ever know. And, uh, and he says there is, there is actually a, uh, a direct poisoning that will occur when you get up to that 300. So, um, so and he, you know, there was a, a quite a, it was a number of years ago, the, the you know, average for a Zeke was, was a, above 12 tonne and, uh, and that crop went eight. It was a magnificent looking crop, but, um, but it was just, it was basically um, poisoned with nitrogen. So, um, so yes, so we, we uh, yes, you, it certainly needs nitrogen to yield, but it needs the right amount of nitrogen. Nitrogen is, uh, you know, what you were going to hit this year, approaching a thousand dollars a ton. Um, so that you know, nitrogen use efficiency uh, can be, uh, can be a big saving. So just be, be aware of that. Um, any queries or questions, thoughts on any of that? I might just say, Mark, around as well with uh, urea application and, and the nitrogen around the best you're going to get out of the crop is by putting it up front. So when you think about if you're transitioning from aerial sown crops to direct drill crops, you're obviously putting most of your urea up front prior to sowing your crop. And then from a drill perspective, you need to do the same thing in terms of you're putting most of your urea um, at delayed permanent water. And then that idea that PI is just a top up because you're gonna get more sort of bang for your buck if you're putting urea up front versus topping up a PI, putting too much of PI. Yep, and there's, all, there's always the discussion, particularly where we're delaying uh, the permanent water, we're looking at a bigger crop that um, uh, how much yield are we, are we dropping by not having that nitrogen on for quite a while? Uh, Brian's work showed None. He's he's um, uh, you know put nitrogen at all stages. Uh, the efficiency of nitrogen uptake at a flush is is very low. It's a it's a it's a, a quite an inefficient way to apply nitrogen because as that soil dries out again, that nitrogen turns into gas and it's lost. Um, so uh, and equally uh, a mid season top up in a in an aerial sand situation, it's the same thing. It's um it's a it's a not an efficient way to apply nitrogen. If the crop needs it, um, yes, it needs it, but um, um, but yeah, be aware that it's it's, yeah, it's not that efficient and it's a rather costly way to put in nitrogen. Um, the plant recovers hugely. It it, uh, it doesn't have that bulk at a delayed permanent water and a drill sign crop compared to an aerial sign crop. You don't have that bulk, but the uh, the maturity or the physiological stage of the crop is the same. It it uh, you know it might be four or five tillers, but it's half the bulk. Um, but as soon as you put that permanent water on, that you'll get that bulk really quick. So it, um, it compensates quickly. The other thing about drill sign, which we really haven't touched on, um, is uh, at drainage, one you've got, because you've got that consolidated seedbed, it, um, um, you know, you've got high trafficability, it, it drains well, it's not that long before you can get a head on. But whether it's to do with the root system, um, or, or what it actually does, it's probably a more extensive root system rather than a big ball. Um, it does um, dry down, it, it, the rate of dry down is slower uh, for the grain. So it'll hold the moisture from say, you know, 22% to that 18% for a longer period than aerial sun crops do or, or dry broadcast crops do. So, um, um, so your, your quality um, is often, not always, but is often better uh, because you have that bigger harvestability window uh, at, at, that, at that grain moisture and you can often get onto the ground quicker anyway. So you can, you can uh, optimize your harvest within that, um, within that moisture limit. So, okay, I will um, hand you back to Troy.
Are there any other questions around nitrogen insufficiency and urea application or anything to do with data fertilizer as well? Just, uh, I, I can just see Frank's face here, and I'm just, just uh, reminding me of, um, of um, mid season uh, top dress. And again, this is, is regardless of the same method, but, um, but, uh, but it was a drill sign crop that I'm thinking of. Uh, and putting in sulfate of ammonia compared to urea, um, and is that sulfur fix uh, required? And um, and equally, is there a difference in, in efficiency? So um, sulfate of ammonia will not volatilize as quick as urea will. So it won't turn into a gas as quick. Um, so you do have more flexibility in, um, in applying it. If the sulfur is required, is it or not? Um, sulfur is certainly required for plant growth. Uh, most of our soils aren't limiting in sulfur. We don't have a history of single super now like we used to have. Um, so it, it, there's a possibility it is. It is an expensive way to apply both nitrogen and sulfur compared to a, you know, a, a, a gypsum application or and urea, but, um, um, but it is anecdotally, uh, people you know, like it and, and, uh, and they get a good job at it. So um, yeah, I just say a uh, thing there, can mice be a problem with direct drilling? Um, interesting question. Um, Last year with mice, I don't think they were more prevalent with direct drilling. They, um, mice don't, well, they haven't affected establishment really. Um, last year, the, the mice were an issue at, at that milky stage. Um, we actually thought they'd be a bigger issue once we drained, but they actually don't like rice that much. Um, uh, in saying that, there was a lot of mice damage around because of, but, uh, they'd, but they'd certainly prefer corn or wheat. Um, but uh, they love it at the milky stage and, and there was damage 50, 60 metres into a flooded bay um, and where they were just sucking the milk out of the, uh, out of the grain. Uh, and a lot of damage around the outside of bays, but, uh, but I, yeah, I don't think drill sound was more affected more than aerial. Any comment on that, Troy? Well, I just think it comes back to preparation. You know, if, it's, if there's mice around, you your bait, like, don't let it become an issue. Uh, it's like anything. Yeah, the better pre preparation you have, the easier it is for the rest of the season. Because if they're there at establishment, they're only going to build up throughout the season uh, and get in your banks. And then no one likes walking banks to bait. So if they're there, get into them. But I'd say the price of um, you know, winter cereals, um, I think people are baiting anyhow, but that would be my recommendation if you see them. Bait, clean them up before the season and gets underway. I think that's you know, most of what we want to focus on today. It's about preparation. Get your fundamentals, get the basics, get the foundations right, and the rest of the season is so much easier to manage and your results will be um, far superior. Just the other comment I will make, Mark, on your about um, flush dates and sowing dates and that sort of stuff. So, yes, um, there's ways to manipulate it with your... Um, irrigation scheduling and your nitrogen there's also if you're really running late change your, your sowing method so if you're going to do delayed permanent order and you don't get it sown in the you know within the window just get um go to conventional you miss that one go to aerial if you miss all them may, maybe change varieties go to vn so there's lots of options there um particularly if you're putting in a large uh, program and you get a rain event or something that holds you up. There's, uh, there's plenty of uh, tools in the toolkit to ensure you get that PI happening in the first two weeks of um, January. So I think that's really critical, that, that um, key step. Um, it wasn't just last year, but it, we see it every year. Uh, it's really, that's you know, a real key step. So I think there is, um, yeah, other tools in the toolkit, um, certainly. So. There's a couple more questions there by the look of it. Uh, applying urea immediately post permanent water compared to before accurate spreading on irregular bays. So applying urea immediately post permanent. Mark, I'll let you take yeah, that one up. Um, but it's it's a no. Yeah. Yeah, it is a no. <laughs> so um and and um 
the efficiency comes from uh, spreading onto dry soil and then washing immediately into dry soil. Um, the efficiency of dropping it into water is uh, is is poor. Yeah, is very low. The reason that we top up at PI is um, it's a relatively efficient time to apply nitrogen. It's it's you know the benchmark we know what measurement should be. So it's it's that sort of critical time for nitrogen as it's as the plant's preparing to to push itself into a reproductive phase. But um, it's, it's a lot more efficient to apply at PI because the plant is actively growing so fast. It's putting on more bulk um, or it's growing faster than basically any other crop at PI. It's growing faster than corn, loose and, and uh, um, so it's actually preparing itself. It puts on a lot of these little filament roots um, to suck oxygen out of the water. And, um, and because it's doing that, it actually sucks that nitrogen out of the water uh, really quickly. You can really see it, you know, green up behind the plane. Uh, but applying it when it's, it's um, you know, three leaf or even three tillers, uh, you've got a lot of water exposed. And um, yeah, it's, it's not an efficient way to do it compared to um, spreading it on the ground and, and washing it in that way. Um, drill sowing rice on rice. Um, yeah, look, the, the, the old uh, way of looking at it was, it was always a no-no, uh, mainly because of barnyard um, control. Um, we have the, the, you know, chemicals in the, in the toolbox now to, um, uh, where it's, it's, uh, it, certainly no dramas. I know plenty of people who do it. Again, as Troy said, it's, it's that preparation. Uh, as long as you can get a, a decent, um, um, I was going to say a decent seed there, just not necessarily right. It, it's a, it's an even grade. Uh, if you're looking, you know, torching and, and putting it straight in, uh, you're going to get a lot of wheel tracks. Um, there's going to be compacted areas from harvest. Um, it, you know, at minimum, I think needs a boarding, um, but depending on the, on the ground um, and, and the machine you've got, um, you know, if you know you're going to get that good soil seed placement and depth, then um, and with the machine you've got or, or can, can hire, then, you know, that you're going to be a lot better off than, um, and trying to scratch it in and uh, and having suit all over the place. So, uh, but yes, plenty of people do it from a weed control point of view. There's certainly tools in the toolbox. Uh, it's having that right machine to um, get your soil seed soil seed contact and and good uh, depth and and seed placement. Yeah, and just go back to the one. There was also a second question about accurate spreading on a regular base. So, yes, and that's why the person used the the plane that uh, the example Mark gave. So um, that's one of the reasons to, for if you've got a regular base, uh, obviously if you've got sectional control on your spreader, it is perfect. Well, that's the perfect way to do it. I did see a crop, an example of that last year, um, compared to the, uh, both um, Kuhn spreaders. One had sectional control and just did a lot better job uh, on them smaller bays. So that's the perfect world. Uh, and then, Agree with Mark, uh, drill sowing into rice stubbles. The number one thing to look out for this year is make sure you get a really good uh, stubble burn. Um, stem rot may be an issue this year. It was around a bit last year with the wet winter, etc. So make sure you get a good burn. And um, But yeah, that's been done multiple times. It's not an issue. Um, what about drill sowing rice on rice in a bed situation? I don't, I've had no experience with beds. I've observed a bit. Mark, you want to have a quick comment? We are push, a little bit pushed for time. Yep, so uh, yeah. Just a quick comment on that. Can't one. see any any dramas with that. Again, it's about the, the paddock um, preparation. You, you, you've you probably got a little bit more flexibility in beds and you're not going to have those, or if you do have wheel tracks, it's still going to drain. Um, but again, it's getting that um, that decent soil seed placement. Um, so you get the depth and get the, the um, um, soil seed contact. Yeah, I, I think that's a it's a good option. Um, there is a few on this call that have, do it. Those have rice on beds. They might might like to to make a comment. Um, certainly, the rice on beds is it's um, you know it gives you great, great flexibility in the rotation and the uh, winter crop side of things. Um, with with you know should be bugger all delay uh, or, or without any yield penalty in um, in the rice. So. Probably be aware though that the depth of your furrow, you know, on a two meter bed, 25% of your country is tied up in furrows. 
Um, so just be aware of the depth of furrow because if it's too deep, uh, your rice plant has to be well established to get that permanent water on. Um, and, uh, and the furrows will often be, um, you know, uh, delayed in maturity compared to the rest of your bed. So 25% of your paddocks delayed in maturity. Um, it's just, you know, you really only want a furrow depth of sort of no more than 100 mil rather than the conventional, you know, probably just double that. So, um, but yeah, the, the rice on beds is uh, it's great. I know someone this year is putting it into three metre beds um rather than two meter beds and i know so, um, so i think they already had sown it's a rice on rice on beds was their question so um so i think they they already do it but they'll just ask yep. about rice on rice yep. we will uh, push on yep. so, uh, yeah just on that uh, mark uh, so quickly just want to yep sorry uh it's rob here um i'm just out at the irex site here mark and um just looking around, we, we burnt this field about a month ago, and there's a lot of ratoon rice coming up, as you can see. And there's quite a few mouse holes in the in the block as well. I know we did talk about about mice control, but will the uh, will the flushing help in that regard? Do you think? And the, and, and what do we do with the ratoon rice? Just um, spray it out and round up. Yep. Basically, return rice is actually pretty hard to kill. Um, uh, but yeah, good way to round up. And yes, the flushing should. It, uh, again, it's going to be the banks where the, they build up. Um, you know, they're not going to, if there's any nesting mice in there, they're going to be drowned out. So, um, so yeah, the flushing uh, will it. And uh, any other comment on return rice, but it's a good way to round up as, as much as I can uh, recommend with it. But I'm not, yeah, I, I, don't know if there's another recommendation, Troy. Uh, no, look, you're sowing the same variety. So traditionally it hasn't really been a, an a issue where it's the same variety. Um, you'll see it'll it'll grow and do its own little thing, but virtually come to nothing because it'll pi too early and get hit by cold. But um, yeah, that's previously the experience I've had with it. It'd be an issue if you're going to a, a um, short grain or something or trying to grow a different variety, it certainly would need bowling over. Right, we, uh, there is another question there, but we will just skip through a few more slides and then come to the questions at the end. So those that want to go can go because we do want to try and finish at 10. So just quickly about um, weed control herbicide um, use. With drill sowing, it's really important that you have your own sprayer or you've got a contractor that you have a really good relationship with because that timeliness um, post first flush pre-emergence of the rice is a narrow window. Also, sometimes in some big blocks um, that take you know over a week to do the first flush, that'll be a staggered emergence and also staggered ability to get onto the ground. So, you know, if it's a 40 hectare block, they might have to do it in two lots of 20. So you either got to have your own sprayer or have a really, really good relationship um, because also in between that, you still got to dodge um, weather. You know, it might be a, a rain event. There might be, you know, wind for a couple of days. So it's, it's, um, yeah, really important. I think it's um, yes, there is options if you do miss the the three way mix, but they're certainly not um, as effective as getting that three way mix on, and it's more costly as well. Um, the alternative, so um, that's mainly what I wanted to say there. Um, so yeah, just those just to give an overview. So certainly, your first port of call for any weed management is your agronomist, um, but yeah, just generally we do that re-emphasize a knockdown spray in September, October, but prior to sowing. Um, and then post that first flush and prior to emergence is a three-way mix, Gramoxone, Magister, Stomp. And I'll, um, you know, it just works. It is a great um, combination of uh, herbicides and it works. It doesn't matter what the population is, plant, the you know weed population is, uh, it's just so effective and I, I just can't, I haven't seen anything that works better. So it's really important to get that on. Then for your secondary control grasses, you sort of got your jixes or, or auras. Um, so that's, you know, around permanent water time. So there is, um, yeah, as I said, your number one resource for weed management is your grow 
agronomist, there is the New South Wales DPI protection, crop protection guide. And also there is a um, YouTube video on the rice extension website where Malcolm Taylor talks all about um, management of our um, rice. Uh, just a quick, give you a visual. So this is a delayed permanent water. So this is what we're talking about um, to try and give you a visual of what it looks like. Uh, then, as we said, we apply the urea um, pre-permanent water onto a real dry soil. So that's where you see all the little cracks and how it's dried out. That's what you're looking at when you go delayed permanent water. Uh, you know, the, we've got the tillering uh, of the plants and that's where you'll get really good efficiency out of your uh, nitrogen. And so this was 300, so this is the same crop as back there. Um, about six days later with 300 kg urea. So that's how quickly, once you hit it, that permanent water and the urea and the efficiency of it, you get that canopy closure very quickly. So um, uh, straight line, Mark calls it uh, straight line variability. Because uh, he brought it up, I thought I'd just show these couple of uh, slides. So you can see from the, uh, the yield map over here, we've got lots of variability between the reds and the greens. So last year in a uh, receipt crop in the Murray Valley, I um, did uh, some testing of some uh, high nitrogen strips and low nitrogen strips. So you can really see if we look at the, uh, the fourth column, the yield ton per hectare, you can see the impact that these strips have. So yes, this crop didn't yield very uh, high because of the cold and that's irrelevant, but what is relevant is the differences between where the nitrogen strips were. So you got 2.24 tonne in this bay versus 6.6 .6, uh, and similar, you know, 0.24 versus 5.94. So they're the sort of impacts they can have on yield. Uh, they also have impacts on management and geez, that's not very clear at all, this image. Um, but also, you, yes, you can um, get a plane to do it or you can get a contractor you still need to ensure that their machine is calibrated and the communication is clear. So in this situation, uh, because talking about irregular shaped bays, et cetera, the grower got uh, the plane to do it. But what you can see, he didn't communicate clearly that you know it's all about uh, evenness of application, not about just putting all the urea out that was meant to go out per hectare. So you can see the plane's done a strip a run at the ends, which they always do. And that's where it doubled up and, and yielded nothing. Uh, he also ran a bit through the middle. He must have had a bit left over and thought, oh, on my way home, or I'll, I'll fly a bit more out. And then as they always do around trees, they do another strip and on the end. So, so it, it increased the variability in that paddock just by lack of communication, I guess. Um, but also just as you use a contractor, doesn't mean their machine is um, calibrated either. So. It's about communication. So once again, here's what Mark's talking about, the straight uh, straight line strips in here. So behind the spreader is obviously where more urea is going. And how do you um, improve that or what's the preparation you should do? Get your spreader calibrated. So um, it's a commercial, uh, Russell Nickel does it on a commercial basis, about $800, but very worthwhile. If you go back and see them, your differences, um, very worthwhile doing. Uh, Mark, what was your word for this where the rice is caught under the clods? Constantine. Just wanted to show you a picture of that. Constantine. So that's what Mark was talking about. It was caught under a clod. Um, and then, so that's that paddock where there's lots of clods and lots of Constantine where the paddock preparation wasn't as good. And this is a similar. So this was rice on rice where this one um, had a... Um, uh, not a speed tiller, a um, uh, what's the other similar machine, but anyhow, had it, had it ran over, and that's the difference between the two paddocks. So we had clods there, um, and then yeah, similar to a speed tiller, um, was ran over this one, and just the paddock preparation is that much better. That's the establishment. Um, so I don't know if you're still there, Rob, but you'll see a little bit of return rice there as well, but it, it didn't. Uh, do anything. So what's it look like on the farm? So we just, yeah, an example here of um, Peter and Renee Burke, who used to do dry broadcasting all the time. Um, so yeah, for those questioning about, you know, is it possible that I've dry broadcast or aerial sown all, all my life? What do I got to do to uh, change over to drill sowing? So this, this is what the purpose of this case study was. 
um, their main reason for changing over was the ability to get water, uh, high volumes of water on with the new inlet. So they went from a 10 meg to a 30 meg a day inlet. Uh, also the, the ducks, the abundance of ducks and damage that uh, previously occurred to, um, to their rice crops was the purpose. So what's the keys to their success in this year uh, that we did the case study? And they still do it today. And I've seen the laser bucket run around the other day and it'd be probably going today as well on their farms. It's all about, yeah, just doing that, that final grade or just a touch up with the laser bucket, then running over the wide board just to take any ridges that the laser bucket leaves behind, getting that really good firm seed bed. You know, channel capacity, clean channels to get the volume of water down, get that water on and off. Uh, yeah, very important to have nice clean channels at the start of the year uh, just for that flow. So, yeah, it's a lot about preparation. So, you know, he doesn't own his own laser bucket. It's a contractor. So it's um, spending a bit of money to ensure it's all right. His first few years, um, he got a contractor in with a disc seeder. He obviously does it himself now, bought his own machine. But once again, it's all about getting it right, getting that seed placement right, um, and getting establishment right. So that's, um, see, while he was learning, that's the process he undertook and these are the results so, of his crop. Um, so that's basically his um, program of operations. Um, yeah, sowing early in the window on the 7th of October, 150 kg of seed, uh, 100 and 100 kilo of starter fertilizer, including some zinc. First flush was on the 12th. So that's, that's what Mark was talking about, the difference between, you know, sowing and first flush. So, you know, it's almost a difference of five days there. So you, you've got to be conscious of that, that them dates that are in the growing guide are for first flush, not actually just when you put it in the ground. So just be conscious of that. And as Mark said, we did see implications from them differences last year as well, from people's sowing date to when they actually first flushed. And it's not when the first, you know, first bit of water runs on the top bay. It's certainly that midpoint of the, the paddock. So simple program. Uh, Gramoxone matches the stomp, as I said. Uh, in this case, they use a little bit more Gramoxone to kill some resistant ryegrass. Uh, they had six mil of rain uh, 12 days later, which en enabled the second flush to be stretched out a bit to the 30th. Usually they're about 10 to 14 days from the first one. So about the 22nd, 26th. So yeah, you just got a few more days from a, a rain event, second flush, then they've got another rain event. So in this case, he only did two flushes because of the, the third rain event was like a flush. Then 300 kilos of urea pipe was spreader on the 25th and went to permanent water on the 27th. Uh, did a secondary grass spray, a barn storm, which is no longer available, but that's what Jixa has replaced that, re replaced that. And yeah, PI uh, right on, in the window, fourth of the first. So that's um, a quick rundown. Uh, so yes, he reduced his water use um, in the focus year from 10.9. Previously, he used 13.8 when he did uh, dry broadcasting, and he yielded quite well 11. Point, or when I say he himself and Renee, they're a team. Um, they so the keys to success uh, this Pete's direct quotes: um, the ability to get your water on and off uh, through flow rate structures. Etc. Um, you know, more importantly, getting the water off. So, in some instances where there is still a little low spot, uh, Peter uses his four wheeler motorbike just to um, run a little um, track out to that low spot. So, you just put in two wheel drive and sort of spin the wheels a bit. Uh, there's also is uh, really worth doing and it's pretty easy to do. So, um, ensure good establish establishment of plants to set up the whole year and have a good agronomist who you can call on for advice. So that was his tip. So um, so we've got two more slides to go, which Annie will take us through. So we will just answer these couple of questions. Um, so there, is there any data? Is there any the soil data? Yeah. And any correlation to growth delay? <laughs> Me, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's actual data or I assume there is, but there's certainly, it's a, 
the cooling the soil down is only really an issue whilst it's getting established. Um, once it's up, it's it's not a drama. Um, however, you do actually do, you do delay the maturity with every flush. So um, uh, and the timing between flushes. So and the reason to sow a bit earlier for drill some. So uh, and uh, how much rain is required to activate chemical uh, bugger all? I think Malcolm would uh, would say five mil. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that slide there. You had six mil that that Burks did. Um, so yeah, not a lot. That's um, five mil would be. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. It, it depends a little bit on the moisture of the paddock, uh, Andrew, but certainly, look, I've seen one paddock. It was actually that slide that I used for the air cedar, where it's um, air cedar, this cedar, where it was a bit wet when they sowed. Like two mil is all I had on that paddock, but it did have a fair bit of moisture and the, the weed control was as good as anything. So, but yeah, five mil certainly be plenty. Uh, were there any other questions okay. before we wrap up? Uh, all right, so just in terms of, I mean, there was a lot of information um, over the last sort of an hour and a half. So I guess where we were wanting to come across is if you can take anything away from what we've sort of spoken about, would be we've got sort of three things and that is I think we've banged on about it but the timing is everything around following those key steps that Troy was mentioning which are available on Rice Extension's website as well. Um, being aware obviously of each of the crop stages for your correct management but also Mark touched on how you know you want that PI date to be between the 1st and sort of 15th of January and work your management back from there and obviously take into account if you're getting any rain events and how much urea you're putting on that's going to spread that out so that's that idea around if you're you know for that optimum yield you need to aim for that pi within the first two weeks of january um and then just sort of things to take away for right now is around if you've got an agronomist or engage an agronomist to actually talk through um, if you're planning on doing a drill sown crop or with your rice plan anyway um, the idea of obviously there's going to be a few more rice growers this year. So if you do need to hire a contractor, you need to be having those conversations now and actually trying to put this in with them. Um, and Troy obviously touched on it as well, but the idea of actually calibrating both your cedar and your spreader um, so that you can obviously reduce that straight line variability and get the most out of both the ground and the crop. Um, if you want to jump to the next slide, Troy, in terms of there are a few key resources that we have touched on. Uh, this presentation will be available um, on the Rice Extension website and we have recorded it as well. Um, but those are definitely the key um, resources there. Definitely the Rice Extension website. Um, there has been actually the DPI have released a drill stone rice guide from a couple of years ago, which is a really good resource to have. And then not to mention there has been updates to the rice variety guides for across school um, varieties um, for each of the different valleys um, with a few different updates, especially in terms of sowing date. It has been brought forward, um, I think, five days or so. Uh, so, yeah, definitely check those ones out before you're planning on doing your sowing so that you've got everything all right. Um, but if there's no other questions, then we will let you go. Sorry, we are about 10 minutes over, but lots of information. It's certainly be aware there is lots of support out there for you so if you're wanting to have your first go certainly yeah there's lots of resources and support all right we shall end this and let everyone go back to their days so thank you very much everyone for coming along and good luck and yeah feel free to reach out to troy mark or myself or anna jewel as well um and uh yeah that's the end. Thank you, everybody. All the best. Enjoy the day. Very good. Thank you.